guy joining or no? Move.
Hi all, uh, we have the session with uh, Jerry Rajamani right now. So we are waiting for Jerry to join. Give us a couple of minutes. Hey, Vijay. Hey, Jerry. Hi. Good evening and a very warm welcome to this session. And uh, team, uh, we have Jerry Rajamani who is going to speak on the coaching culture. And uh, uh, coming to Jerry, uh, give me one moment. I'm just. Jerry, I. I think I have a technical challenge. Give me one moment, please. Sure. All right. Sorry. So uh, coming to Jenny, we don't need any introduction uh, for Jerry because Jerry has been very prominent in the uh, agile coaching field from the past one decade. And he's currently involved in leading the digital business agility transformation programs and innovation practices for a multinational financial institution. And uh, he is a, a certified CTC, CEC, and he's also a PCC from International Coaching Federation. Uh, he's trained in uh, training from the back of the room. He has more than 20 plus years of experience as a, I mean, as a programmer, 10 years as a scrum master for more than five years and as an agile coach more than 10 years. So uh, this session will be for one hour and uh, I hope uh, Jerry will be talking for around 45 minutes and any questions you have, please put them in the chat window. We will have some question and answer session in the end and I'll be moderating the question and answer session. So with that, uh, Jerry, uh, back to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, I hope um, I'm my voice is okay um, with that, uh, and I hope you are able to see the slide uh, which has been presenting. I'm just trying to do all of this with a single laptop, so any technical issues, please pardon me. And also, I'm trying to put in the chat window a uh, mirror board. Um, whoever connected from your laptop or desktop um, or iPad or, or uh, mob mobile, just click that. We'll try to make this a little more interactive session. Um, the reason is very simple. It's Saturday night, 9. It's, it's difficult to be listening to somebody uh, for the next 30, 35 minutes, right? So with that note, um, I'm Jerry based out of Bangalore um, and which has given a quick introduction. Thanks for that. And in today's um, next 30 minutes of kind of session, uh, what I'm interested to quickly discuss and share is something around the coaching culture and leadership. So the context I wanted to uh, make a little more clear. When, when you use the word coaching or coach, um, don't constrain with that agile space. Yes, um, agile, in the agile space, it is very important. But what we are going to look at is the uh, much wider <coughs> part. Um, and probably I would say the agile space picked a little bit from that. Okay, so with that note, um, let's jump and uh, see how it goes. Okay, so <clears throat> if I define, again, all these links, images, everything is taken from the internet, um, quite a few web, web references to the HBR uh, article, uh, just as an initial note. So. This is something I like it. Coaching is a universal language of change and learning. Now, why I like that, there's a lot of definition um, for a coaching, but this has got a, both the most two important things. One is uh, dealing with change, and the other thing is about learning. And I believe personally in my experience, um, 
if you are a coach and your main responsibility is a coaching then uh, i hope you will agree with me that these two are go hand in hand and both support and complement each other right so that is one of the thing uh, i just like to highlight and uh, when we talk about um, the coaching culture so i want to bring this whole three pieces coaching culture and the leadership uh, in the uh, subsequent slide but just before going to that part when we talk about um, coaching or the coach it kind of please remember that this is something uh, is there from 1970s um, that uh, timothy galway and uh, the who wrote a book called the inner game of tennis um, maybe few people would have read it and in 1974 um, the most popular um, john whitemore who is who is whose book about um, coaching for performance is still considered to be the one of the major um, uh, what do you call uh, the reference point for many coaches uh, globally so it is it is not something happened new and 1990 in the international coach federation and other international um, coaching organizations came up with that benchmark of defining what is that coaching means right so this is a wider area it's a wider space to learn a lot and uh, in the agile space we kind of use it in a different context and we try to do from that uh, different perspectives but obviously yes uh, as an individual if i'm doing my agile coaching or as an individual if i'm involved in leadership coaching or uh, transformation coaching um, the different aspect of uh, very specific to the agile space if you take still the underlying things going to be the same so now when you look at this um what do you mean by this coaching culture right and uh, um so it's in a, in a simple word if you wanted to put it i would say um in an organizational context so i'm i'm making it very specific to an employee or an individual working in an organization from that perspective i just wanted to take this conversation you can refer to your your own organization maybe you work for an it or a non it you can take that as a reference so coaching culture is a culture within the organization basically which is going to um, support your uh, <clears throat> employees and the culture that emphasize on continuous learning point number 1 regular feedback and an opportunity to grow so if any organization if it, that is if they are able to provide this opportunity in any form of other we can say that organization respect our coaching culture because um continuous learning as part of the work and uh, regular feedback not only top down but bottom up and sideways and also there are opportunities to grow in 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 whatever you do in a new role or a new responsibility um that makes an individual or an employee more engaged right so we will look at quickly the uh, why this is very important and engaged employee but before that um peter hawk in the other of creating a coaching culture he says um <clears throat> the coaching culture in organization exist when the leaders managers and the staff engage and develop all the people and not only within the organization the way they engage with the shareholders and that is also the same behavior which shows up so if that is something as an organization if that is way they interact this is the way they connect and uh, that's what we called as a culture so one of the most important point when you use the word culture uh, one of the easiest way to give an example could be the unspoken way uh, things happen within an organization that's an example or a, one of the definition you can say for the word culture that is how things happen here well in our organization this is how things flow 
right? <clears throat> so in, if you look at from that perspective, so that is also a definition we can give, especially in a corporate culture, you can use that. Now, the important question you might ask, why this is important? That's very, very interesting thing to look at because as we discussed in the previous slide, um, the coaching culture in creates that uh, employee engagement to a high level and the data point which we have, which shows very clearly that 46% of the companies reported higher revenue than the companies which do not have a coaching culture at work. And this is a survey done by ICF. So the ICF stands for International Coach Federation, formed in uh, 1990, set up the gold standard for coaching. So there's something most of the people look up when they wanted to take the coaching as a serious business. And, and if you look at the other thing, uh, in 2020 survey, 36% uh, of the US employer engaged in their work uh, Fifteen percent are actively disengaged, uh, which is a uh, new data, which is in line with the earlier Gallup study, which is also shows only twenty percent of the employee of the workforce is really engaged in the work what they do. So, if you look at a hundred thousand employee or or a ten thousand employee workforce, when you talk about even thirty percent as the engaged, there's a huge potential of workforce within the organization, they are not engaged. And that leads to a lot of productivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, loss. Just by bringing a culture in the organization, which is this coaching culture, which is built on uh, providing a continuous learning opportunity, creating the feedback loop, and also provide them an opportunity to grow, can help those people to be more engaged. So what will happen when you have a more engaged set of people that leads to a yeah, um, better um, outcome or result from the work what they do. Now, how do you as a um, individual introduce this coaching culture? So there are five points which were identified. I wanted to put it quickly. Uh, the first one is lead by example. So please remember that uh, I honestly believe it is not that some designated person has to be the one who is going to do this or the coaching. Anyone in the organization who believe he or she believe that uh, coaching is the way of taking it forward, then he or she can start acting on these help to spread it. So there are organizations, they bring up a enterprise program, transformation program, but in many organizations, this happens in packets. <clears throat> right? So from that perspective, the very first one is lead by example. So before you going to propose, okay, you need coaching. First, we recommend you to go through the journey to validate and see see the benefit out of it, and then go and spread the thing. And the second one is ask the right question. So a little later, I have another slide, uh, which is kind of talks about uh, selling, uh, telling and not telling, or directive and non-directive. So we'll come to that. But here at a shorter level, ask the right question. So a coaching culture encourages employees to learn from their experience. For example, instead of every time I go and tell, you serve as a manager, as a, as a leadership person in terms of the hierarchy in the organization at a higher level, instead of telling them what the subordinate is supposed to do, ask them what do you think you can do about it or how do you react? What else you need to get this done? Changing the question to include. So they may look at you, but when you started asking this question, you started moving away from a managerial uh, managing to a coaching style. The third point is um, to introduce the coaching culture, it is important to start at the top. Um, an organization 
behave the way the leadership team or uh, what, what the t leaders believe if your leadership team believe command and control if your leadership team believe micromanagement that's exactly what translate to the organizational policies organizational um, uh, set and rules regulation and you can see that is the way the bottom most person end up in doing it so and if you take it the reverse way at a point of number level people who are doing something which is not what the leadership team believe then that creates what we call as attention or a little bit of a uncomfortness at the leadership level or the senior or, or the premier top layer and that will not go well in many organization so it is important as a as a decision maker you need to bring that so that's the reason we put it start at the top and make this as a routine so uh, do not do this like a mela. Do not do this like a one once in a quarter or a once in a six months event. Okay, let's run a uh, coaching week. No, it has to be a regular routine. If you, I, if I want to be healthy, I cannot take. Okay, I'm going to do an exercise only three days a month. Right, you need to bring that rhythm, you need to bring that as a habit. So, over a period of time, it has to be inbuilt. So, you need to make this like a routine practice because it takes a long term. So, you need to plan it in a way slow and steady, and there is a cadence to that. And most importantly, make managers accountable for developing employees. So why I added this point? Because when we talk about, again, I, I bring this from an agile perspective, a lot of organization really struggle with this problem of middle management. Many agile framework, agile transformation model is don't talk anything about the role of a managers. They used to talk really bad many years ago. Uh, they kind of ignore. And even today, many times we see the managerial people are ignored in the transformation and they play a very vital role please remember i i had a one of one of my very good friend who, who is a, um, a well-known person in the uh, scrum community he always says we don't need project managers in the agile way of working but we definitely need managers project managers is, is a very different species than managers so don't confuse between these two terms manager is a generic as a manager you can do a lot of things so managers are not it, they were unfortunately portrayed like a bad people many years ago um, but i think now the agile community also learned and they are also a little bit soft and on their tone but it is very important especially if you wanted to introduce the coaching culture you can make the managers accountable one of my recent experiences, the organization I work, um, they are trying to uh, bridge this gap. This is one of the biggest gap identified. They are trying to create a very important role for the managers. I'm talking about the middle managers so that they are expected to invest a lot of time in helping their direct reporters uh, in terms of helping them to learn and contribute and more engaged. So it is very important from that perspective. Now, again, uh, this is one of the thing, um, quite a few slides you might have seen, um, the Google's most popular eight leadership traits. Um, again, the reason I picked up this, I'm not saying you need to copy the everything, but this is something uh, we all work in some way or the other an IT industry. So people, it's easy for me to go and convince or talk to my manager, you know, something we tried and so we can also look into that. So one of the thing is they say uh, as a leader in that organization it's a good coach and uh, as a leader as a manager empower don't micromanage be interested in the reports not only interest show more importance on the report but give a holistic 360 degree uh, perspective on everything they do 
again be a good communicator listen to your team that i i believe everybody does uh, the last important thing is have a clear vision and strategy for the team and that is very important how we are going to uh, support your team so that the team understand the vision and how are they going to achieve it and how they are going to take the support from the manager so that it more of a inclusive group now we talked about the coaching culture also we talked about some of the important point how can we bring it now i wanted to put some one or two slides which kind of touch upon the how part so because we talked about managers as a very important element in this whole because as a manager as a decision maker as a leader when you are going to play this activity or a role of a coach to bring that coaching culture how can you do that more effectively and why this is important earlier days it used to be a lot more a uh, lot more that not a that complex work world that's not the right word but still nowadays we use that a lot i think the in the outside world was a lot more uh, stable so the managers exactly know what is the problem because they are expertise in that area so they tell the team what to do but after the internet and all this internet is the business and everything depends on the internet global market global competition it become to a fact that the managers don't have the answer or they don't know the answer for many of the problem so the team ends up in looking at the managers but the managers still not in the same solution provider or a subject matter expert to solve the today's scenario issues the way they solve their problem maybe 15 years back and today the way the problem has to be solved is completely different because the environment changed so when the environment changed and when i bring my old way of solving the problem when i try to apply in today environment still it's not going to be the same problem because what worked for me 10 years back might not work today right so um, managers are expected to move away from that what to tell um, to so the manager as a managing person prefer to step back and start becoming a coach and that's a better way you can engage with the group of people you work with and also slowly bring that coaching culture so when you look at that it it looks a very simple slide to say um the manager to do from here to here but that's not that easy in the real scenario because it's something like a completely a different style right so if you look at if you look at this uh, thing um uh, here i have put the different um stages or um, on the x axis you have the authority uh, and the right extreme is influence on the y axis at the bottom we have telling and telling the answer and the top is asking question so uh, if you look at the different shades i prefer to use the word shades of coaching uh, given supervision guiding mentoring counseling and that top as the coaching so supervision is also a kind of coaching for me where you supervise uh, which is you have a lot of authority and you tell them what they're supposed to do you have the supervisor role if you know if you worked in the manufacturing industry even today we have supervisors so they exactly tell what to do then the second one is the guidance so here uh, again providing the direction then the third is the mentoring so mentoring again comes to the fact that somebody is really good has done that similar thing for a longer time now i'm going to mentor certain people so counseling is a little different form of the coaching space uh, it's more of providing psychological um, healing and uh, uh, it's a little different domain so you can you can ignore that but the last one is the coaching where it is completely on the extreme of influencing so by coaching your your role is to influence because you don't have authority and the second one is you are not going to provide them solution but if you are going to more ask question to help the other people 
find a solution by engaging them. So the last one I want to quickly touch upon is uh, how to be a good coach. And this is applicable for anybody. You don't need to be a person titled as a coach to do that. You can be anyone. But if you are playing a role of a coaching as a manager, I wanted to coach my team. Then how can I be a good coach? So anyone can be a good coach. Only thing is it requires a little bit of uh, practice. It requires a little bit of uh, trying new things, learning certain things. And probably you can use this two by two matrix. So from the style of coaching is where I, I created, I put this again with the um, credit goes to the um, Harvard Business Review article. So it is directive on the left top and bottom is lazy face. And the right side top is situational and the bottom one is non-directive. So these are the four styles as a coach you can use at any given point in time. The first one is a uh, quickly quick note on, on this four. The first one on the upper left is uh, directive. So directive is more of telling people what they're supposed to do. So this is also a form of coaching, but it's not a very effective coaching. But usually when a technical person moves to a managerial role, we tend to see this a lot happening. Every time when there's a team struck, people jump and this person try to help by providing what to do. But can as a manager, can I do this all the time? Probably no. At some point in time, you need to step back and help them to figure it out. Right. And the second important thing is on the left side, the second row uh, is lazy face. That is not necessary for coaching all the time. Please remember that uh, I, I have seen this a lot with many agile coaches. Every time they work with, with a team, when they go for some of the, um, for example, they're working with Scrum, then they go for the Scrum event, they always give some feedback because they believe they think they believe that they have to give feedback because they've been invited. Not necessary. If things are going well and the team is doing really good, you can say everything is fine and walk away. That's also a coaching stance or also coaching style. Place if it's right. So it's not necessary when everything is going well, when the team and the members are at their yeah, at the good level of productivity, it is perfectly fine. And the bottom right, the quadrant three, is what we call as the non-directive coaching. And this is what build on top of listening, um, asking questions, and uh, withholding the judgment. So this is a pure coaching stance. Um, you might have heard about some of the professional coaches who spoke in this conference also yesterday. Um, so this is something new for many of the people. But this is something they can learn definitely over a period of time. And this is where, and if this is this one, if, if this is the way of the style is going to be, this is where you're going to completely engage with the team and you're going to be the pure coach to help and providing the safety space for the individual to come and um, play the game. And on the top of it, right corner, right side is situational and situational coaching is the very interesting sweet spot um, this is very important for the leadership people and the manager what style is required at on a given point in time whether they have to be a directive coaching style or you need to move to a non-directive coaching style when i'm going to work with a set of people who are new to this what is going to happen where I have a lot of knowledge, probably I have to be more of a directive style. When the team is matured, the individuals are matured to a certain extent, probably I might shift to the non-directive. <clears throat> so when you talk about the non-directive coaching, I just uh, wanted to quickly highlight this. Um, this is something new to the managers. So this is where we expect the managers to first practice this. Um, learn it and becoming their second nature. Uh, then uh, one of the most popular thing most of the people use as a model in this is the grow model, right? 
you might have heard about the grow model i'm not going to go deeper on that part it is to identify the goal what is the current reality what are the options to reach the goal so this is where we want to go this is where we are here this is the gap how are you going to address this what are the different options available and then in the available option what could be the better way we can take it forward because not all options can be used all the time there could be budget constraint technology constraint etc etc so within the given thing uh, how can you go about it so it's one of the very popular uh, uh, model uh, grow model by john uh, whitemore 1978 or sometime he wrote the book so from that time even today many coaches uses this model right and this is one of the example for the non coaching non directive coaching now the last thing i just wanted to quickly highlight is till now what we spoke about is as a manager as a leader how can i think and shift to this coaching culture and when i am pretty comfortable uh, with that particular thing how can i start spreading it to other people is that enough in an organizational context my answer would be that's a good starting point but when you look at in an organizational capacity um, that is not enough so when you look at the whole organization to um, get into this coaching culture at an organizational capacity so a lot of time you obviously yes to start with the, you you keep spending time in teaching the individual leaders and managers to be a better coach you might have seen quite a few organizations start their uh, manager as coach or coaches manager as an internal program to bring these new skills and competency to the managers so that the manager can move from telling to um, providing the space for the team to find the solution so that is a shift for them so that they can be more actively engaged so for that the, when that started happening and that is where we talk about a cultural change the whole organization started getting into a new cultural thing we were in a more command and control culture now we are moving to the coaching culture for that to happen at an organizational level obviously uh, some of the point you can start looking at is start with why why it is so important if for, from our organization perspective to have this coaching culture without a strong why because my competitor is doing we wanted to copy probably that's not a very strong uh, reason to introduce this right and support the start the with the why with the behavior so for model the behavior so this is where we looked at those five point started the leadership uh, start at the top um, then practice you first practice then before you go and preach others and build the capability obviously introduce this through different training different forms or other ways so that people go experience it and when that started happening obviously there could be other barriers which are organizational specific as a leadership team as a decision makers invest your time and uh, effort to remove those barriers so that this coaching culture has started seen across the organizational entity so in a summary if i wanted to put it down so today we live in a world of flux um so as a leader as a manager as a coach um you have to keep continuously developing your uh, capability your capacity by keep learning and help the people uh, you are supervising and because today in today's context the managers cannot follow command and control because most of the time um today problems you you may not even face to your, all your experience so there's something for you as a manager or leader so new so you have to collectively find a solution <clears throat> and if in this whole process instead of a directive if you're getting into a non-directive which is the coaching style you could be able to engage with create a better engagement and when you are able to get a better engagement uh, with the teams you are working with 
that creates a better encaged employee. And when you see that encaged employee percentage goes high, as a whole organization, you see a lot more better benefit. So if you remember the uh, few slides back, 46 percentage, right? The ICF study says. So it's a very interesting thing. So that is one of the way you can to have a happy employee, probably more engaged employee, introducing the coaching culture as a across organization with the support of the leadership people, with the support of the managers, as managers and the leadership people playing a coach role, then a managerial role could be one of the way to look at. So that's what the message I wanted to pass on. Let me stop here for any question and answer. Yeah, Jerry, we have one question here oh. from Heman. As a coach, how do we uh, how to build credibility with leadership coaching when a leader is much higher in, ex in experience than the coach? Um, can you can you say that question again? Uh, sure, Jerry. Um, as a coach. How mm -hmm. to build credibility with uh, leadership coaching when the leader is much higher in experience than coach? Okay, so there are quite a few um, elements in this question you are touch upon. One is um, leadership coaching. Okay, the second one is um, when that leader is having more experience than the coach, right? Um, so I'm not sure about uh, what is your definition, the, the person who asked the question, definition of uh, leadership coaching. Uh, let me do one thing. Let me stop the uh, sharing. So the reason why I'm saying that is leadership coaching is a different world. OK, uh, the whole coaching itself is a very, very broad spectrum, which has got quite a lot of uh, unique um, specialization area and leadership, leadership coaching is one of the pretty expensive um, niche domain uh, especially for the consultants so if you're talking about um, in the agile also we have agile leadership and other stuff um, which has got its own way to deal with that but there are leadership coaching for example um, there is leadership circle profiling uh, there are leadership circle profile uh, practitioners. So who, when they work with the leader, it doesn't matter how experienced you are as a leader. Because again, the question, if I read it, the, the one of the tone I'm hearing is, how can I solve my leader problem? Because the leader is already experienced so much, so many years of experience, I don't have it. The very fundamental of coaching is, you are not going to solve the coachy, in this case, the leader's problem. The leader know the problem and they know the solution. You are there going to provide what we call providing the safety space. And also we use the word uh, providing that um, mindfulness and quite a few things to help so that the coachy, in this case, the leader, find the solution by himself or herself. So leadership coaching is a un just becoming a coach is a starting point, but there are a lot of quite a few tools. So because the coaching is a pretty vast area, as I said, if you want to be a very effective coach, uh, I, I I think there are certain tools and expertise you will learn over a period of time because especially when you deal with leaders, they wanted very clear reports to understand which area they have to work. So there are leadership models available. And as a coach, what we do is we do the assessment and do the debriefing. So from that perspective, it can still work. So one of the thing, uh, if in the question the person asked is still there, uh, you can search, check for leadership circle. There's one of the very popular leadership uh, coaching model in the industry. I, all these things what I'm giving is nothing to do with Agile. Let me be very clear. Um, it is beyond that. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Um, I think we can take another question. Uh, it's by uh, uh, the same person, Heyman. Uh, so he asks, how Agile coaching works in an already Agile organization? So the, the question is the definition of Agile. What, do, what is that mean by my organization is Agile? What does that mean? Right? It's, it's, there's no standard in the industry. Um, for, a, for a service organization, 
um, in increasing the velocity by three times or threefold, right? This is also organization claim we want to be agile because we need to increase the velocity from 40 to 120. It is right or wrong is a different debate, but there are organization even today get into that kind of a thing. And there are organization talk about we need to go to market by 40% uh, lesser time. That's what their definition of agile. Uh, there are some other organization talk about we wanted to create self organization self organized team small team uh, collaboration increase the collaboration increasing the customer uh, net promoter score right so it is very very organizational specific so first you need to ask what does agile mean there's a very beautiful uh, series of article uh, written by i forgot in the forbes uh, magazine uh, online uh, by i think it, stephen deeming or if i'm not the radical change author so he talks about what is agile so he had, uh, it's, it's a long quite a few years back there was a joint venture study between scrum alliance and there's a consortium he was heading it so they studied microsoft quite a few big corporate and one of the beautiful examples of microsoft the journey so you can claim agile but they have done a lot of other things also it's almost a eight nine years work right so uh, in that article he write um, the definition of agile means different to different organizations. Some of the organization forming small cross-functional, uh, highly collaborative teams, right? So identify what is agile in your context, point number one, and then, so that is their uh, goal. Where are we? So if you put the grow model on the top of it, where are we is the reality and what are the options to go and reach? And if you see the organization is at its fullest potential, you can obviously say, I think you guys are the best of the jail. We, we guys can be the one of the benchmarking um, uh, at that st uh, benchmarking level. So probably you don't need an agile coach. It's uh, end of the day, agile is there to support the business. And obviously when, in today's changing market, I'm sure the business needs to find different ways to be in the top of the market. Right, so it's all about a continuous improvement. Thank you, Jerry. So, team, uh, if you have any more questions, as uh, Jerry said, coaching is a very wide spectrum. So, you should have like what so many number of questions if you are already practicing. So, please feel free to post your questions, and we have uh, uh, Jerry to take any questions. Thank you. So we have uh, one more question, whether Lazy's fair coaching actually happening. <laughs> OK. It can happen if, at least in my experience, a few years back, one of the um, product line we were working, uh, one of the manager who had said group, uh, many times just ask the team how is it going everything's fine okay and he never comes back to the team for the next two to three weeks the staff meeting that's a word we use there the staff meeting is not more than five minutes so it is not that because that there are um, 20 he used to have a team of 40 40 plus people so he ran a 20 20 people staff meeting um so one of the 20 people group is not more than five minutes because that, that because the team is delivering what is expected and there are certain things they are improving because the team run a two-week sprint and the enterprise run a two-week sprint so they identify improvement areas so that the, the, the report whatever he see is pretty happy so he makes it very short and simple because I'm a manager, there are these 40 people are reporting to me. I have to keep giving them, feeding them, and, and challenging them. Not necessary. Because there is a wrong notion, I believe, in the in the uh, many people. Unless we don't challenge them, they don't improve. 
I think that those are all the very, very, I don't think that is really needed. People will learn all the time. People will improve all the time. You don't need to challenge them. It is all about um, people are smart. Uh, so it's all about the survival. And so they will figure it out how to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Any other questions, anyone? So, Jerry, we have a couple of more questions coming in. Uh, we have one from Prati, which says, what would be your one suggestion to all or any transformational agent hmm. dealing with the fixed mindsets in powerful positions in the organizations? who are scared of losing their identity if the teams are self-organized? Hmm. So the, the first question I would like to ask is, how do you know that that leader having fixed mindset? So if you say you're a coach, uh, or if you're claiming you are a transformation leader, um, non-judgmental is a very important thing, right? Maybe, maybe your question is very valid. Uh, you might have worked, tried your level best uh, to go back and again and again and again. And you finally concluded, oh, this person has this attitude or the kind of fixed self. Then you choose to decide whether you still want to work or not, because um, not all people, not all the time, they want to change. There are so many other parameters also important for a person to change. Or somebody is nearing the retirement and they were um, having so much of industry experience, their LinkedIn profile glorify what they do. And uh, because of that is where they hold this position and I'm reaching another one or two years. Now I'm scared to move to this new way of working because always the new way of working is a, uh, unknown angel. So people prefer to be with a known devil, right? So there's some other things we use, but that's a reality because things can go wrong because i don't know so they, they don't know that they don't know the unknown unknown right so as a coach you can try to make them unknown to uh, unknown unknown to known unknown there's something they should be aware of it but from that to known known to become your second muscle memory that is the individual choice to learn i cannot force people all the time i can only make them aware and coach responsibilities to creating that awareness. So self-awareness is the most important. I think Toby, in his one of the previous talk also, he was talking about that, right? Emotional intelligence and other stuff. And this is exactly the reason we talk about leadership people need to have the very high emotional intelligence. It's not about them, but about the others. And I don't think anybody lose uh, their identity because the team is self-organized. I, I think that is a very wrong understanding because people will respect. Uh, so I can say, tell this many years, 2010, I used to work as an agile coach for one of the biggest uh, mid-sized storage organization. I, so it's almost 12 years back. So I was reporting to the CTO in India, Bangalore. Um, there are quite a few managers. They're very skeptical. So I go and tell them, and typically they're senior manager and they report to the director. Director is very supportive, but middle management is completely against. So very challenging three managers. So I was literally asking my support to my reporting manager. So he said one thing I still remember. He said, Jerry, OK, so that is a senior manager in the fourth floor. He's a senior manager. He's one of the few senior managers in that level four. We're on the fourth floor of that particular wing. Okay, because the office is in waving and beaving to to uh, to tower. If you get out of that and go to the cafeteria, he's one among the many managers in this company. If you walk out of the office, he's one among the few hundreds in that tech park. You know, Bangalore tech parks are pretty big, and if, and if he is in the Bangalore streets, he's one among the many nobody care. That's what you are. People will realize one day till that time, don't spend your time on that. That's what he said. I, I still believe whenever I come across certain people, that's the only thing I still remember. So it, it's very difficult. Sometimes people 
maybe are fortunate to have that identity. So let them be in that uh, position all the time, no problem. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Jerry. So we have one more question. Uh, do the coach always expect it to be more experienced than coachy, or it's just an old school of thought? Um, if you are a consultant, <laughs> um, to okay, I am just quoting my mentor coach. He told me when I did my professional coaching journey to 2012, 10 years back, he said, if you want to charge high, you should have gray hair. Okay, but that is a little bit of a cultural thing to that. Um, in especially in the Asian, India, Southeast Asia, the gray hair believed that you know more experience. But again, please remember if you have more gray hair, the millennials may not like you because they prefer to work with somebody who looks of the same style, right? So you have to balance that out. Uh, but if you are really somebody looking for a mentor, then I would say yes. But if they're looking for a coach, then no. Because as a coach, as I said, you can you will not be able to solve someone else's problem. That's a foundation of coaching. So maybe the other person not sure about the role of a coach. Is it not necessary? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. We have one more question. Uh, how can we showcase ROI? on coaching in the organization in case your leadership is looking for results in six months or one year? That is something I would say easy. Um, again, um, when the very first engagement with the leadership people, they are paying you money. So obviously, please ask them what they look for at the end of six months. That's the goal. And then um, I find, so for example, a lot of um, the agile transformational model, they do this discovery phase, right? Spend that with the team for one or two sprint to understand the ground reality, right? So this is what they look for. This is what they are. And with the end of one month, you know exactly what the leadership team is looking for. Is it uh, something you can able to help the team to achieve it? Please remember, you are not going to deliver. You are going to work with people to help them to deliver it. So you cannot commit unless you know what is going on. If you're in the same organization as a full-time employee, you may have some more context. But if you're going to take a new engagement, because Agile coaching, there are a lot of Agile consultants, right? So they don't have any head or tail. Uh, so they are maybe on the day one, talk to the leadership people, go to the team. They have a 180 degree perspective, which is completely north and south pole, right? So you need to balance it out and find out what does that mean. And if you are able to get that, agreed upon so we call them as a coaching agreement or whatever that's not the contract but the coaching agreement this is what we want to achieve again break down into phase one or a end of two months end of four months end of six months and measure and show the progress and that's one way it's a little more easy yeah coaching alliance is other one the word we use coaching alliance is a r specific term you have to be mindful <laughs> about that yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, you, thank you jerry for that for answering that question uh, so we have one more question and i think it's uh, we have five more minutes so this will be the last question and then we will uh, close the session for today so the question is name of the book that you have talked at the beginning of the session so uh the book name um it is coaching for performance John Whitmore. Yeah, it is a book written in 1980, Coaching for Performance. Um, this book is considered like the go-to book for any person. Oh, uh, again, let me put it very clearly. It is not about agile coaching. Uh, to be very honest, agile coaching is not a coaching. Okay, <laughs> it's agile mentoring is what actually agile coaching because uh, if you're talking about agile coaching, then probably this is a book I still recommend. Coaching Agile Teams by Lisa Atkin, one of the great book to kickstart. Even today, there's still a lot of books are there, but there's still the good book to start. Why I'm saying that is uh, the pure coaching is a little different game than the Agile coaching space. And the Agile coaching, uh, coaching is one of the stands. We have facilitation, we have other things also we need to take care.
Thank you for answering that question, Jerry. And yesterday, one of the speakers also suggested for Agile coaching, you need to, you have only one book. I mean, you, this is the golden guide is Lisa Atkins. So thank you for that. There's one more book, Agile Coaching by Rachel Davis. For some reason, and um, it's not, she's a, a UK coach. Um, I think I met her in 2009. Uh, she came for one of the con uh, workshop with us. I read that book. I liked that personally, Agile Coaching by Rachel Davis more uh, for some reason. Uh, but that's not a <laughs> that popular book like Coaching Agile Teams by Lisa. But so. I'll give you two books. Thank you. So, uh, Jerry, uh, thank you for being here and uh, patiently answering all the questions. And I know that you have wealth of knowledge. And from that, like sharing some snippets from there, we, we thank you very much for your time. And also for all the audience making this session more engaging. And uh, thank you for your support as well. Sure. So. Twisha, my, my, my partner, uh, thank you for being there as my co-volunteer. Thank you very much. So thanks, Jerry. Thank you. And team, thank uh, have you. a good uh, Saturday night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. I see Nagesh has already posted the links to the book, so you, you all can keep it handy. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone, thank for you. attending us. Yeah, thank you.